Good morning. We'd like to go ahead and get started this morning. It's been a while since we've met, and I know everyone's happy to see everybody. And uh, some have already gotten their first set of shots. Some have already got their completed sets of COVID shots. So hopefully, eventually, one day we'll all get back to normal. And uh, whenever that happens, and then we'll all be, you know, very happy, happy about it. Um, as far as those that are, are sick and shut in, is there anyone that needs special prayers or anything like that that need to be made known about? Uh, Savannah, just want to let you know, had a C-section yesterday and uh, Lincoln was born. He was nine pounds, nine ounces. He was a big boy, big boy. <laughs> yeah. and she and he was two weeks early. So if you think about that, how big in two more weeks that baby could have grown, he would have been another big boy. So <laughs> I think that Lincoln and and Zeke they're going to get a run for their money because they're both really really big. So uh, uh, yeah, because Zeke's in. 18 months close and he's only six months old. <laughs> he's he's really, really, he's a big boy. So we're glad they're both, all, all of them are doing well there in Dallas. Um, their life is almost back to normal, uh, except for the water restrictions other than that. Uh, their house, you know, had a little bit of heat uh, during the time that the power went out. They had a gas fireplace. And, they were able to remain warm and made it through so until their power came back on. So they were out for a couple of days of electricity in that. So with that being said, I want to read to you Psalm 1. 1. We'll start this all over again from the first book of Psalm. It says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but is his delight is, is in the, the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. I'll be reading from Luke chapter 14, verses 25 through 27. Now large crowds were traveling with him, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. <coughs> The reading of the psalm before our prayer this morning comes from Psalms chapter 2. The title of it is The Messiah's Triumph and Kingdom. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rules, rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. 
I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter vessel. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son of God. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry. And you perish in the way, but his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Good morning, church. Good morning. I'm so happy to see you all over. I tell you, this 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 COVID stuff is, uh, you know, it'll 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 drive a, a sane man a little bit more nuts than he wants to be. But uh, I think we're we're getting better. And uh, anyway, uh, I just wanted to say, you know, all of us, uh, that, you know, this, uh, these scriptures that Bob puts on Facebook. Uh, one, one of the uh, lines that really got to me was, you know, it, it just kind of opened my eyes up. Um, the Bible is not a book of suggestions on how to worship and live. You know, it, it's, it's kind of like that, that word should and shall. You should do this. But if it says shall, you will do it. So uh, anyway, I, uh, th those things like that just kind of, I, I really like reading them. Um, let us pray. Our God, we thank you again for all those uh, that are here today and uh, be with the ones that... Uh, they couldn't be here and, and some of them that didn't. You know, it's this COVID thing's just got everything so up, upside down. And uh, we thank you so much for our government that, uh, you know, the COVID shots, we're getting the COVID shots uh, to take care of us uh, here and in our country. And uh, we thank you so much for the rains that we've been getting. We've getting, been getting rains on and off. And, uh, and we're so fortunate that, that we live here in Florida, Lord. We thank you so much for that. I mean, uh, I like the snow and I like to look at it, but I, I really don't want to have to deal with uh, what Savannah and them had to deal with out there in Texas. That, I know that that was a frightening mess so we ask that you be with all the people that live in texas that's had all that and, and uh and really had a hard time you know with the water and electricity and uh, not and the food and uh it, it was just so bad so we ask that you be with all them people and watch over them and and uh all the government agencies and everything go out there to help them. Lord, we're so fortunate in this country that uh, that we do have a government that will help us. Uh, maybe not 100%, but there's always something there, you know, that we can get something done. And uh, Lord, we ask that you... Uh, uh, be with the leaders of our country that watch out and, and uh, govern this country in a Christian manner, Lord. That uh, everything is uh, uh, just put out there to where we can understand it. And uh, some people, uh, they, they, don't, they don't see it like Christians see it. 
and uh, we, we just have to look at those people and just say, well, eventually we hope that they'll turn around, but sometimes they, they don't, so we just have to knock the dust from our shoes and move on. Lord, we thank you for all your blessings, and please forgive us of our sins, Lord, and thank you for all the ones that are here today. In Christ's name, amen. 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 <laughs> The reading before the Lord's table this morning comes from Psalms chapter 3. And the title of this is, The Lord Helps His Troubled People. Reads, Lord, how they have increased who troubled me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him and God. But you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory and the one who lifts up my head. I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill, Selah. I lay down and slept. I awoke for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of 10,000 of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people. Selah. Before we take the Lord's Supper, I'd like to read from Titus in uh, chapter 3, beginning in verse 3. For we also once were foolish. Uh, ourselves disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. That being justified by his grace, we might be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy statement, and concerning these things I want you to speak confidently, so that those who believe God may be careful to encourage in good deeds. These things are good and profitable for men. And <laughs> Jesus died for a reason, and God's in control, but the problem we face right now is that mankind has got to the point where they want to control everything, and they think they have control over everything. But all it takes is a little thing like a virus or some cold weather to bring us to our knees. And we realize who's really in control, who we really need to turn it all over to, who we really need to magnify and worship and give thanks to every day. God's greatest work, uh, salvation is God's greatest work, not reward for man's worthwhile acts. And that's what we've got to keep in mind every day. And when we get to the point in our lives that we think we control it all, just think about how easily we can be knocked to our knees. So we need we have reason to rejoice that we have a Savior that died for us. And we remember that this morning in, in taking this communion. Uh, we need to focus squarely on the cross. And all that came from it, the hope of eternal salvation, but the wonderful life that we can live now 
if we turn it all over to him, not just part of it, not, not just the part we want him to control, but all of it, and do it all the time, not just in hard times, but in good times as well, especially in good times, it will have a much better life. Okay, let's pray for the bread now. Our Father in heaven, we can take this bread symbolic of your son's broken body. We're so thankful for that, Father, and that he came, that he lived here for a while, and he rose again. We have a living Savior. And Father, as we can take this bread, we do it in remembrance of that sacrifice. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Likewise, fathers, we partake this fruit of the vine, symbolic of the blood that your son shed upon the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. I pray that we do this in a manner that is pleasing to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 written in the Bible about money. God knew, I guess, how we were going to feel about money. Yet sometimes people get to the point that they think the money is the answer for everything. Again, it doesn't take much until you realize that all the money you've got in the world won't help you sleep good at night. Won't believe that nag that you have, that, that desire you have to, to uh, feel better, even though you're in perfect health. So uh, we do well here at this church in giving to uh, the uh, different organizations. If you have, uh, the, I know the children's home and golf officer right now, they're really, they're really struggling to keep their head afloat, but they're dedicated to the children they have there. If you uh, are apt to, you could send a donation to them. We send a monthly donation. We have been for quite some time, and they truly appreciate it. But um, anyway, the uh, collection place in the back, we do still have bills to pay. And all of our money that we're spending out now, we don't have anything other than electricity and maintenance, but that's uh, expensive. Uh, but we are supporting the missions and we've increased our mission giving and uh, that's what we all need to do. Not only at the church, but in our personal lives every day. There's a lot of things you have that you can share with other people. Just put something that use, that's usable out by the road and see how quick somebody comes and gets it. What difference does it make what they do with it? If they have a yard sale with it, fine, you know. That, that, that's better for us. Uh, so let's think about that, our giving and, and our giving our, how God, what he gave us in his son, and what Jesus' attitude was about giving. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we're truly thankful for all the worldly pleasures you give us. But Father, help us be mindful at all times that you gave it to us. It belongs to you. And that we should honor that by being willing to share it, and care for other people that will make life equal for all mankind. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 The reading before our message today is Psalms chapter 4, and the title of it is The Safety of the Faithful. Here David says, 
Hear me when I call, O God, of my righteousness. You have relieved me in my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. How long, O you sons of men, will you turn my glory to shame? How long will you love worthlessness and seek falsehood, Selah? But know that the Lord has set apart for himself him who is godly. The Lord will hear when I call to him, call to him. Be angry and do not sin. Meditate within your, within your heart, on your bed, and be still. Say, oh. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the, in the Lord. There are many who say, who will show us any good? Lord, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. You have put gladness in my heart, more than in the season that their grain and wine increased. I will both lie down in peace and sleep, for you alone, O oh Lord, make me dwell in safety. Well begun is half done. And if you know the book of Joshua, there's a little bit of a joke in there. Joshua chapter 12 is the middle of the book, and so we're half done. And, okay, just for those of you that are following along with your Bibles, we're going to be working with Luke chapter 14 and James chapter 4. So turning to Joshua isn't going to help you much. Because in Joshua chapter 12, what it is, is a list of the victories. The first part of it is the victories that Moses had. And it lists off the people that he defeated. Then it lists off the people that have been defeated under Joshua. And that's a pretty interesting list because first two we recognize, King of Jericho, followed by the King of Ai. Then the next five kings, Jerusalem and the other four that he contacted, and then come the rest. Joshua's list is a list of 31 kings, which means the battle that just took place in chapter 11 was against 24 different kings. 31 kings in all. That's a pretty impressive start. And, yeah, it's a start. The picture that I've got up there on the screen is of an individual who's climbing up, maybe a hill, maybe a large mountain, can't tell from the picture, climbing. Whether or not he makes it to the top that's up to him. If he doesn't have any kind of accident, doesn't twist his ankle and so forth, it gets down to what's the effort he's going to make. When we started out at the beginning of Joshua, we were told, God has given. It's not a matter of whether or not Israel has the ability. God tells them, I am giving you this land. We see in the first 11 chapters, the one who gives the victory is God. Even when there's innumerable chariots and horses and so forth, 24 armies coming out against Israel, armies that are coming from the royal city, cities where every man is a warrior, they have victory. Why? Because the victory comes from God. If Israel's going to climb the mountain, of defeating Canaan is going to be because one, God has empowered them to do so. Two, they have the determination to follow through on what God has given. So let's jump forward, as I said, to Luke chapter 14, and this is the passage I already read. Now large crowds were traveling with him, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. And that's a hard passage. Hard in so far as hate's a nasty word that we don't really feel comfortable with. I'm one of those that's... 
I work with my kids and let them know whenever they'd say, I hate whatever. It's like, whoa, whoa, time out. Let's not go there because hate is a really strong word. You don't want to start off by saying, I hate an individual. Identify what you don't like that they've done. You can hate somebody who is violent. I mean, when I say, oh, yes, I just blew it. You can hate the violence that they do. But do yourself a favor and don't address the hate at the person. Identify the action. That way it's easier to love the sinner and hate the sin. But, as I said, it's a complicated passage unless, unless we break it down and the NRSB, in my opinion, does one of the better jobs at translating this passage. Because it says, life itself and the cross. When it comes to life itself, how much control do we really have over life? Not talking about death, but life. Oh, well, if you eat these certain foods, you'll live five years longer. Is it really that we live five years longer? Or is it that when we eat bad food, we die sooner? If you exercise more, oh, you'll add another seven years to your life. Is it that we're adding to our life? Or is it that by being lazy, we're really taking away from the life we could have had? The truth is, we can't add life. That's not within our scope of being. What we can do is mess things up and bring on death sooner. Life itself, it's something we've got no control over. And trying to hold on to it, how well can you hold on to it? Can you hold on to it to the point death never comes? No. So trying to hold on to life, trying to love it as though you possess it and control it, no, that's just lying to ourselves. But the more important part of this, and this is what helps give the context, the cross. The possessive that gets applied in most translations is a slippery possessive that probably isn't there. The cross. And think about it. When Christ went to the cross, was it his cross? Did he die for himself? Or was he dying for us? The cross that we bear. Are we bearing the cross of our sins? I hope not. Because that was Christ's cross to bear. He bore our sins. He struggled for us. He lived a life without sin as an example for us. When we're called to bear a cross daily, the cross we're bearing is not our own. The cross we're bearing is the example we're given for others. The struggle we're going through isn't because we're still bearing our sins. Another has done that for us. We're struggling to be better and better and more like Christ. The passage we just went through in Mark 14, that first part, isn't talking about the sin part of the cross. It's not talking about hate of people. It's talking about what direction we really need to be focusing on. And that's not on my life. It's not on my cross. It's focusing in the direction God wants us to be focusing in. Because as I said, whose cross do we bear? It's those that we want to have an influence on. Our children. Our neighbors. And just to help bring this into a, okay, we're going to hit the wrong side of it first. 
a right of perspective, preferring them above others to love, honor, and cherish. We get that, talking about marriage, and unfortunately, it's too easy to look at the negative side. But I draw the line when it comes to, she better not mess with my football, better not mess with hunting season, better not mess with and pick the line that gets drawn in the sand. And it's a messed up line. Because essentially what we're saying at that point in time is, well, I'm married, but this other issue comes first. What we just read about is telling us, you know what, there better be no issue coming first when it comes to God. God comes first. If your wife is on the highway to hell and is not going to get off, it doesn't mean you join her on the highway to hell. If your children are cruising down that direction, to win them back doesn't mean you hop in the buggy and cruise on down that road with them. The right example is what's going to lead them in the right direction. Not making them feel comfortable about the wrong. The decisions we make aren't going to be easy. It's going to be a struggle sometimes because sometimes you're going to want to make them feel more comfortable. It isn't that bad. No, sin is sin. We don't need to coddle it. We don't need to make them feel comfortable about the sin itself. We do need to make sure they understand our love and commitment to them. It's a commitment to them because we're committed to God. We're committed to work out that relationship in a godly way. We need to be careful how we approach it because, like I said in the beginning, well begun is only half done. We've got to be there for the long haul. And we find that in Luke 14, 28 through 33. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to wage war against another king will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot, then while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can go, I'm sorry, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. When Israel went into the Promised Land, how much of it was God holding back? None of it. I'm giving it. So what was holding Israel back? They began with 31 victories. 31 impressive victories. The armies of the royal cities have been taken out. I believe there's three, maybe four royal cities that are actually still functional because their population was that big. Sure, send off the army. We're still two-thirds of the people still there. So they're going to have to take out those cities with their armies already decimated. They won because of God. If they're going to be held back, it's because they're holding back from God because they're holding on to what they brought out of Egypt. If we want to succeed with our spouses, succeed with our children, when there is a problem that we face, we can't hold ourselves back by hanging on to problem issues if we want to succeed with them where it counts. We've got to recognize whose plan's best. Is it mine or is it God's? I think everybody knows right now, Rich, you're mostly clueless half the time, so definitely not your plan. God's plan is going to be the plan that wins out. 
you got to remember, we have the promised land. It was given by God. Christianity. How much of that battle do we still have to win before Christianity is a given win? None of it. Christ has already won it for us at Calvary's cross. Think about marriage. How did that begin and where did that begin? All of these start off with best intentions. When they went into the promised land, they went with the idea, yeah, we're going to win it. When we get started in Christianity, we begin with the idea, yeah, I'm going to make it. When we go into marriage, we're making a commitment saying, you, me, forever. This is going to happen. We start off with a really right intention. But what happens? And we've already been going over that what happens part. When we let other things get in the way, and notice how I said that, when we let other things get in the way. Sure, things like COVID are gonna come up. We're gonna have accidents where the deer jumps out in front of the vehicle and mangles it and the vehicle's gone for a while. We're gonna have things that happen that make the road rough. Who has enabled? God. If God has enabled, if God's the one who desires it to end well, who can prevent God's end? The ones who still have the choices. Because God's not made us automatons. God is not forcing the victory down our throats. We're the ones still in control, still free will agents, who in the end can choose against God. James chapter 4, beginning with verse 1, reads, Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Adulterers, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Puts it pretty much point blank. We're making choices. And when we're choosing for the world, we're choosing failure. We're choosing to be an M. M I am not going to get the word enemy out when I'm trying to say enmity at the same time. We're choosing to be an M. M that word with God. We're choosing. And you know what? It's a pretty stinky choice. We have the power to choose, no matter how nasty the world makes it seem. Just because somebody is suffering in sin doesn't mean I've got to go down too. Fact is, if I want them to overcome that sin, the best chance they've got is for me to work to succeed to give the better example. You don't teach a kid the alphabet when they're itty bitty, when they go A, B, C, G. You don't repeat after them, no, it's not A, B, C, G, because what have you just done? Reinforce A, B, C, G. The more they hear it, the harder it is to get past that. You say, wait a second, A, B, C, D. You tell them the right thing. Because the quickest way to teach them is to teach them right. The hardest way to teach them is to try to show them all the wrong ways are wrong. The best way to help out someone caught up in sin is to give them that right example. 
He's talking to us on two different levels here in James. He's talking to us about first, what is holding us back? Ourselves, our desires. When we put those desires into the church mix, what have we done? We've made it worse than it could be. Because our desires have no place in the mix. Our desire that the color of carpet be blue in a church building. <sighs> and I mean, <sighs> because it shouldn't matter. And I have no places where they said, if it's not blue, I'm leaving. Wow. Really? Is it that important? No. And if we allow it to become that important, who's messing up? Present and accounted for. Elevating a worldly decision to a godly level is not elevating. It's bringing down what we're calling godly to a human level. We need to be careful, not just within the church, but within our families, within our lives in general, that the witness we are striving to give is focused strictly on God's Word. We need to be careful that the things we call godly are really just that, coming from God. And if it's not, we need to make sure we're framing it that way. My preference is for blue. I'm not going to be a happy camper if it's not blue, but if everybody else decides green is the way to go, okay, I'll live with it. Fine, live with it. I'm colorblind, I could care less what colors are. I'm the guy that walks out in scary outfits and Vicki doesn't see it before I get out the front door. There have been times when they've told me, Rich, we need sunglasses and we're thinking about calling, uh, charging you for an eye doctor appointment because man, you're blinding us with what you're wearing. How was I to know shrimp, yellow, orange, and I forgot what other colors I had on were not an acceptable com combination. It was on a shirt, it was on shorts, I was good. They weren't. It didn't matter. How many songs we sing before communion? It doesn't matter. That we're reading instead of singing songs? It doesn't matter. It says each of you. It's not just the time we come when we're reading, when we're praying. It's the time we come together. Are we encouraging one another? Are we lifting each other up, letting each other know you're valued? It's about that encouragement that helps us face the world, a world of sin. And remember that, you know what? I am called to something better. The people that make me feel good about that calling are the people I want to be spending time with. Because then I'm not stressing about, well, how does my outfit look? I'm not stressing about, oh boy, did I just blow it politically, job-wise right now. There is a reason God has given. And that's an important thing to remember. Because all that what's happened, whether it be marriage, whether it be Christianity, whether it be the promised land. It all boiled down to when we let or left something in that didn't belong. Or we didn't do something we should have done, such as make sure that I actually plugged in the power supply to my laptop that has just told me you're about to lose it all. God gave us the answer. It's in his book. His answer begins with his son. The sacrifice that he made to make it all possible for us to overcome. We are empowered the same way Israel was empowered. They could have all of Canaan. And when I say have all of Canaan, I don't mean the land. I mean they could have been there 
with their kids, with their grandkids, with their great-grandkids, living in the promised land. Something so much bigger than a piece of property. But for temptation's sake, but for false gods' sake, they blew it. And yeah, I'm getting emotional because I'm thinking about families. We are given a guideline. Raise them up in the Lord. And it's not just bringing them to Bible school. It's what do you talk about when you're at home? What's important in your home life? What are you emphasizing so that they recognize God's important to mom and dad? It's not just a Sunday, Wednesday thing. It's an everyday thing. When Harry Potter, and I don't know if I can say that, it's been recorded, oh well, too late. Pick your movie. Pick your sport. Pick your activity. When those things come first, we've told our kids something comes first before God. We've told our neighbors something has come first before God. We know it's wrong when we let something come first before our spouse in marriage. It's like the groundwork for divorce. We know from Scripture why Israel failed. Because they left stuff in or they left out the good they were supposed to do. God made a way through his son. God gave us a way through scripture to know how to be better parents, better husbands and wives. If we set it down and only pick it up Sunday morning and Wednesday night, we're setting up the groundwork for failure. Scary statistic, most Christians have never bothered to read the whole book. Most Christians don't read the book regularly. How can we live by this standard if we don't know it? The call to God through his son was one of love. The call we have to give to others is on the same terms. In love, through the sacrifice Christ made. It's the difference we should have in our lives. But it's a choice. Well begun is only half done. The beginning begins with baptism. When we turn our lives over, and take on Christ as our Lord and Savior. That's the beginning. That's half done. What we continue to do from that point forward is what continues to make the difference. If we're striving to live Christ-like lives based on His words, we're going to finish strong. It's not just finishing strong for myself. It's finishing strong for Vicki. It's finishing strong for Tyler, Matthew, and Sierra. It's finishing strong for the people I work with, the students I've encountered. Because you don't know when you're gonna encounter a student from Zimbabwe who says, well, we can't do Christianity over there because it's a white supremacist religion that's designed to oppress people of color. I haven't been able to really look into Christianity until I came to the States. Okay, let's talk. Those opportunities are opportunities placed in our life by God to act, not to let them just pass us by. Every day we have a choice. We have the choice first to begin with Christ, and every day we have the choice to go forward with you need the prayers of the church, you're more than welcome to stand as the scripture is read. Psalm chapter 5. The title of, of that chapter is A Prayer for Guidance. 
and it also kind of really gives heed to everything that we do. It says, Give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my meditation. Give heed to the voice of my cry, my King and my God, for you I will pray. My voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning I will direct it to you, and I will look up, for you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness, nor shall evil dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand in your sight. You hate all workers of iniquity. You shall destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and the deceitful man. But as for me, I will come into your house in the multitude of your mercy. In, in fear of you, I will worship toward your holy temple. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before my face, for there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is dis destruction. Their throat is an open tomb. They flatter with their tongue. Pronounce them guilty, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions, for they have rebelled against you. But let all those rejoice who put their trust in you. Let them ever shout for joy because you defend them. Let those who love your name be joyful in you, for you, O Lord, will bless the righteous. With favor, you will surround them as with a shield.